What do you know? Today, Ben Bernanke announced Operation Twist version 2.0, I guess you could call it, uh, this afternoon, and said that the Fed is willing to do more, to take further action in the future if the labor market, for one, doesn't improve. He also said this, though. Monetary policy is not a panacea. Monetary policy by itself is not going to solve our economic problems. Hmm, okay, yeah, well, we've heard both those comments before. I don't know if he's threatening us or if he's saying that lawmakers need to do something. I don't know how this all adds up, and, and that's just one example that came out today. So here to decipher for us is Jim Rickard, Senior Managing Director at Tangent Capital Partners and, of course, author of the bestseller, Currency Wars, The Making of the Next Global Crisis. And Jim Rickards, what can I say? Any day where there is a, where there are rounds shot off in currency wars, you mm. are the best person to talk to. Thanks, Lauren. Yeah. So Great thanks for being on. Thank you. And a month ago, about when we last mm. talked, you predicted this. You said the Fed is going to act. It's just a matter of time. Mm. Uh, you also mentioned that hey, interest rates have been at zero. This has not juiced the economy with any kind of recovery that's sustainable that the Fed has perhaps wanted or hoped it would achieve. And contrary to that, it's created an atmosphere of fear. There is an atmosphere of fear, and mm -hmm. people are saving their money. So given all of that, what does more Operation Twist do? Who does it serve at this point? Does it serve anyone? Well, it serves the Fed's purposes. I'm not sure it serves kind of everyday Americans. We've spoken in the past, Lauren, about how one of the effects of this is to keep short-term rates, bank rates, deposit rates extremely low. So if you're a saver kind of doing the right thing, you're getting no return on that, that savings investment. But what uh, one of the questions that I asked uh, Chairman Bernanke today is, you know, uh, you know, ten-year note rates, that's the, that's the sector of the curve that they're buying to kind of keep that down. They're already pretty low. What good is this going to do? But what the chairman said was interesting. He said, when the Fed buys a ten-year note from a private investor, or a dealer, they have cash, they're going to go buy something else. The Fed wants them to buy stocks, wants them to buy mortgages. It's, it's just more market manipulation. So it's more, it's more than getting the 10-year note rate lower. It's forcing investors to buy other riskier assets, and that will pump up asset prices such as stocks and housing. That's really what the Fed wants. It's not all about interest rates. It's about getting asset prices up. And propping up the market, the stock market, propping too. Propping up the market, correct. So then when the Fed says that it is willing to act if things get worse, is it kind of holding out for a, some kind of catastrophe with, say, Europe? or the fiscal cliff that the United States faces at the beginning of 2013? And what would even be the bigger guns at this point? Outright buying of stocks? Because it's already bought so many fixed income assets. Well, well, the Fed has the legal authority to do that. They haven't said they're going to do, yet, do that yet. Although uh, Bernanke, years ago, kind of in 2002, gave a speech where he said that's one of the things we could do. So they've acknowledged that. Legally, they have that authority. Uh, yeah, I mean, QE3 is the big gun, whatever you call it. They could say we're going to buy a trillion, and that's a, that's a pretty big, uh, you know, bazooka, as uh, Hank Paulson used to say. Uh, but I thought it was really interesting. The chairman made it very clear that they will do that. They are prepared to do that. I do expect it later this year. The question is, under what conditions? What are the circumstances that would make them do that? We mentioned, too, he said, if unemployment gets worse, or if Europe goes into more of a meltdown, obviously it's kind of a rolling crisis over there. But he said if it really starts to implode, banks start to fail, you get the domino effect, that's another one. So, so there are two right there. Um, you know, higher unemployment or unemployment not coming down fast enough and a real crisis in, in Europe. But again, you mentioned a third one, Lauren, which is the fiscal cliff. If we get to next January and the Congress hasn't fixed this, and we have the largest tax increase in history, which is what it'll be. Just, just by doing nothing, we get the largest tax increase in history with the expiration of the Bush tax cuts, that could be a third thing that could cause the Fed to act. So whether it's, I kind of expect something in August, September, but whether it's then or after the election in January, you can see it coming. Okay, and maybe that's when he's saying monetary policy can't do everything, which he's said before, but maybe it's a warning yet again to lawmakers, hey, this fiscal cliff is coming up, don't make us do the heavy lifting or what people would perceive would want us to do right. the heavy lifting, you know, which, which I, I don't think any, either of us would want. But last time we spoke, too, you said that you thought the ECB mm -hmm. might act, too, that this right. could be the wild card, that the ECB would lower interest rates. And now there seem to be expectations a month later that coming up this July 5th meeting, that could be one of the outcomes. Do you still think that that's coming? I still expect that. Probably a 25 basis point rate cut. By the way, that ECB rate cut that's coming, that I see coming, is one of the reasons the Fed could hold off. If the Fed thought the ECB was not going to cut and Europe is just going to get worse, 
they might have announced some kind of QE3 now, but they, I mean, obviously they talk between themselves. I mean, Bernanke said he talks to Draghi. It's one of the guys he talks to. So they can kind of see that coming. So the Fed says, you know, we can hold off on QE3 until August, September, because the, the ECB is going to pick up part of the slack in the meantime. So, yes, I do expect the ECB rate cuts to come first. Now, another question would be, why didn't those ECB rate cuts come sooner? The answer was the Greek elections, which we just had last mm -hmm. Sunday. Mm -hmm. They didn't want to ease ahead of the Greek elections because that makes it too easy on the Greeks. So keep the pressure on, uh -huh. get the Greeks to kind of do the right thing, which they did. Then you get your rate cuts, then you get your QE3. So that's the sequence. Interesting. I want to talk to you about okay. Europe in a second because you have had a slightly different opinion than a mm -hmm. lot of the guests on this show, and some of the recent actions seem to be supporting your thesis. But I first want to ask you uh, about recent reports that central banks are preparing for a coordinated action. Mm -hmm. We've been hearing a lot about that, that if, if things really get bad, that there are, central banks are bracing to act together to provide liquidity and, and stem this market crisis. How does this factor into currency wars? Is this kind of a currency cooperation and currency wars are suspended in a situation where it's so extenuating of circumstances that people are worried about total chaos, total catastrophe? Right. Well, usually when central banks coordinate, it's usually about exchange rates, which could be part of the currency wars rather than interest rates. We've seen the major central banks ease sequentially. So you get Chinese easing, then U.S. easing, and then European easing. I don't think we've seen them all in a coordinated global ease. What they do sometimes, uh, they get together, particularly the G7, and they'll have a coordinated exchange rate intervention, usually targeting one currency. They did this in uh, 2009 with the Japanese yen after, uh, after Fukushima. So that was one, uh, one example. Sorry, 2011, I think that was. Um, that was one example of that. So it would be a little surprising if they coordinated interest rates. That's kind of neutral mm. from a currency war perspective, because usually okay. the way you fight the currency war is you hold your rates constant, I cut my rates, so my currency gets cheaper. But if we all cut our rates at once, it's not clear what impact that has on the exchange rates. Probably not very much. Interesting. And on the euro, you have been bullish on the right. euro, despite a lot of naysayers. Mm -hmm. It's a very different opinion than a lot of people that come on this show. And recently, just over the weekend, we saw Greek elections, where at the end of the day, the Greek voters elected parties that are pro bailout, mm -hmm. are pro status quo, are pro euro. How does this fit into your thesis and, and how do you stack that up against some other bad news such as Spanish yields that were above 7% this week? It's, it's consistent with the thesis. I've said all along that the euro, well, the European monetary system that, you know, the 17 nations that sponsor the euro will hang together. No members will be kicked out. No members will quit. I actually expect they're going to add members over time. So this is consistent with that. Greece is very clearly going to stay in the euro. I think that phase of the crisis has passed. You know, last summer, it was a foregone conclusion that Greek would, Greece would be kicked out or mm -hmm. quit. I think that's, I, I was saying they wouldn't. I think it's pretty clear now that they're not going to quit the euro. Uh, but you do have a separate issue, which is the euro, <coughs> U.S. dollar exchange rate. <coughs> Pardon me. That's traded in a very broad range between $1.20 and $1.50 over the past two and a half years. So the center of the range is kind of 135 It's at the lower end of that range now, so I would expect it to kind of bounce back up to the middle of that range. The real um, news we'll be hearing, that I think the next two bits of good news, this Friday there's a big four summit in Europe, uh, France, Italy, Spain, and Germany. Mm -hmm. You know, the rest of the countries are a lot smaller. They want to get their act together before the European-wide summit on June 28th, 29th. Okay. That's when we'll see some very big announcements, and I think positive ones. Okay. And on a lighter note, we talked about the humpback whale twist. Right. <laughs> you know, what else can the Fed do? And before we started the show, you mentioned the butterfly twist. Right. What was that? Well, the, the butterfly is, uh, is any trade where you've got, say, three points along a yield curve and you want to sell the short and sell the long and buy the middle, or do the opposite. You might buy the short, buy the long, and sell the middle. But basically, the idea is there are two wings in the middle, so it resembles a butterfly. But it's very similar to the whale diagram that you had up there. But the traders will call that a butterfly trade. Um, the problem with, with the butterfly trade now, you don't want to fight the Fed. I mean, the Fed's out there uh, buying, you know, six to ten-year notes. They, they said up to 30, but in terms of volume, most of that will probably be around the ten-year note. So if the Fed's buying the ten-year note, I'd be a little cautious of selling it to them. So you might, you might actually want to piggyback on the Fed trade, buy the middle of the curve, and then sell the wings. Interesting. Yeah. And what does Operation Twist mean for gold? Because gold sometimes, you know, typically will go up because of stimulus, right. but Operation Twist isn't 
a, not an expansion of the Fed's balance sheet. It's rather a change in composition. So Correct. how does that affect gold? Uh, well, gold went down today, and, and I think gold was looking for QE3. Gold was looking for more money printing. Clearly, money printing, you know, combined with a little increase in velocity, is inflationary. That'll drive the price of gold up. So they did not announce new money printing today. You're right, right. Lauren. They're changing up the yield curve, but they're not. It's sterilized as the technical term, so they're not increasing the money supply. So that was kind of bad for gold. My my long run thesis on gold hasn't changed. I do see it in the five to seven thousand dollar range over kind of a three to five year period as confidence in paper money begins to collapse, but that's not something that happens overnight, and the, the world governments and the IMF can print a lot of money before that happens. This is true, and quickly before we go to break, we'll have much more with Mr. Rickards after the break, but you have a slightly uh, interesting, nuanced reason why the Fed may not be auditing its gold, as so many have demanded. Quickly, what is that? Well, I get into this debate a lot, and I'm asked the question a lot, you know, is there really gold in Fort Knox? Uh, I, I believe there is. The best information I have is that the gold is there. Half of it's in Fort Knox, half of it's at West Point. Um, I'm very sure the gold is there. A lot of people are skeptical of that. But the reason they mention, they say, well, if it's there, why won't the Fed audit it? Or why won't the Treasury allow an audit? They must have something to hide. But I can think of good reasons why they wouldn't audit it, even if the gold is there. Specifically, it gives too much credit to gold. Remember, the Fed wants to pretend that gold's not important. Bernanke says, well, we have it because it's a tradition. Right. But he doesn't put any more weight on it than that. So if you, uh, you only audit things that are important. So by auditing it, you're sort of saying gold is important. They don't want to say that. So that's mm -hmm. one reason not to audit it. And we know that the Fed is a little obsessed lately with communication. Oh, yes. <laughs> it's, well. it's focused on what their communication is right. indicating to the public. <laughs> Welcome back. Let's switch gears now and talk about the dark force that our guest says is destroying the U.S. economy. Forget central banks for now, though, I mean, I guess they could factor into his narrative, actually. But let's talk about what Jim Rickards calls a third party that exists in the United States, not Democrats, not Republicans. I'm talking about the institutionalized rent seekers. So Jim Rickards, senior managing director at Tangent Capital Partners, author of Currency Wars, is going to tell me who is in this party of institutionalized rent seekers and how are they sucking the economy dry? Well, before we get to the membership, Lauren, it's probably good for the viewers to describe what rent seeking, rent -seeking means. Absolutely. It's actually a technical economic term. It basically means an economic participant who takes more than they give. So Steve Jobs is not a rent seeker. Steve Jobs was enormously wealthy. Bill Gates is enormously wealthy. But they gave more than they took. They created wealth for society. They got their share, which is fine. Nothing wrong with getting rich as long as you're contributing more than you're giving. A rent seeker is someone who figures out a way to manipulate the system to extract wealth for themselves, but they give very little back or give nothing back. So they actually destroy wealth for society. So I identified, you know, because the big issue in politics is the Democrats and the Republicans. They won't talk to each other. There's no bipartisanship. They can't get anything done. It's all stalemate. And why is that? And I said, you know, historically, the parties could get along. You go back to Dwight Eisenhower. He was sort of a good liberal. He spent a lot of government money on education, technology, and infrastructure. Mm -hmm. John Kennedy, a Democrat, was very conservative. He, was, he cut taxes and uh, stood up to communism. So the parties can get together, but there's something holding them back. These rent seekers in the Democratic Party, it's public sector unions who are double dipping, you know, uh, pumping up their last couple of years uh, pay so they can get inflated retirement benefits, retiring at 55 with lifetime medical and the rest of America is working until they're 70 and mm -hmm. paying their own way. On the Republican side, you've got Wall Street. You've got the banks, uh, Jamie Dimon, Lloyd Blankfein, Goldman Sachs, et cetera. They figured out a rig game. They're getting very wealthy. They're doing fine for themselves, but they're really hurting society with you know, derivatives and risks. So, so if, if each party could get rid of the rent seekers in its own party, if the Democrats could separate themselves from the unions and the Republicans could separate themselves from Wall Street, leave the rent seekers to their own devices, I think, we, I think liberals and conservatives could actually come together with some solutions. That's interesting. Uh uh, however, how do you do that when you have uh, rent seekers entrenched in politics because they are putting money in and they're lobbying? Uh, what is it, for example, with the banks? Because is it some kind of change in regulation or is it instilling personal liability in, in these firms where there is maybe like what Jim Ricker or excuse me, James Grant talks about, which sure. is the Isaac Clawback plan to claw back? 
compensation over a certain amount for seven years if your firm becomes insolvent and you're federally regulated? Well, we're starting to see little glimpses of that. Those, those are very good examples. Uh, I think uh, you know, Scott Walker, even though he's a Republican in Wisconsin, certainly stood up to the unions. Union membership is declining, but more importantly, people are staying in unions, but they're choosing not to pay dues, so union revenues are declining. And then on the Wall Street side, you are seeing proposals like that. Even Jamie Dimon said we might have some clawbacks coming out of this uh, London whale trade. So there are little, little signs of that. Uh, I'm also encouraged to take Rahm Emanuel. He's sort of everyone's uh, you know, favorite liberal, or if you're conservative, maybe at least favorite liberal. He's starting <laughs> to stand up to the public sector unions in Chicago. After all, he's the mayor. He's in an executive position. He's got to make the budget work. And he's saying to the unions, enough already. So when you see conservatives standing up to Wall Street and liberals standing up to unions, that's a very positive sign. It means people understand that you know, we have to create wealth, not, not kind of suck the economy dry. Or maybe it, they just realize that these things are at the end of their rope. There's right. only so much sucking that can go on. Despite that, I want to play you a little bit of what Jamie Dimon said in his hearing yesterday. Jamie Dimon appearing in the Senate last week, the House this week. Lawmakers seeming bowled over by him. They mm -hmm. they didn't give him the hard time that, that some other people would. I would have preferred you were there questioning him. I would have had a him. few questions, right? Yeah. So this is why he was saying he does not agree with some kind of reinstatement of a Glass-Steagall type mm -hmm. regulation or legislation. Let's take a listen. Sure. WAMU and IndyMac, which were monoline thrift kind of savings companies, uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, which are the biggest financial disasters of all time, were monoline mortgage insurance type companies. All of that happened and had nothing to do with Glass Eagle. I mean, he, of course, neglects to mention the firms that were saved by bailouts, but that aside, is he, of course, going to protect his too big to fail status and monopoly because that's what allows and enables a firm like his to be a rent seeker? Well, that's pure nonsense from Jamie Dimon. I actually don't know how he gets away with that, but just to kind of take what he said for a moment. Yeah, there was a lot of stress in Fannie and Freddie and uh, Andy Mac and all that, but why was that? Because the housing market was collapsing. Why was the housing market collapsing? Because of unsafe lending by banks and other originators. And why was all that lending going on? Because Wall Street could package it into securities and sell it to German banks. Who had no idea what they were buying. So if you didn't have that Wall Street securitization machine and that Wall Street derivatives machine behind it, you never would have had the lending in the first place or the inflated asset values or the collapse. So he's looking at the other wrong end of the telescope. He's pointing to the victims and saying, see, that had nothing to do with us, when in fact Wall Street created the problem through securitization and derivatives. I think it's a disgrace that Diamond gets to sit there and say that and nobody challenges them, challenges mm -hmm. them on it. Mm -hmm. And does the, the status that he has allowed and afforded as a too big to fail institution Sure. Solidify his rent-seeking ability and status as as a party in Washington. Absolutely, and look at the look at the uh, campaign contributions J.P. Morgan is is giving him. I, I spent a certain amount of time on Capitol Hill, and I. I Talk to some of the members. There's not a lot of appetite to go after these banks because they're certainly on the Republican side. They're giving them too much money, and on the Democratic side, they're the, I mean they're fully invested in Fannie, Freddie, and Dodd Frank. So the mm -hmm. Democrats don't want to criticize the mess they made legislatively. The Republicans don't want to bite the hand that feeds them. So nobody's going after these guys. Meanwhile, the economy's suffering. So. So in some ways, the rent seekers are still doing a lot of damage and winning. But yes. You have hope yet, and I appreciate you being here to, to explain your thesis and break down all of this news coming out. Thanks so much. That was Jim Rickards, author of Currency Wars. The man I have to talk about is just the man, Jim Rickards. He's senior managing director of Tangent Capital Partners and author of this bestseller, Currency Wars. And we're so thrilled to have you in studio. Nice to see you. Thank you, Laura. Nice to be here. First, I just have to thank you for being so sweet in your support of our coverage of Davos. It was really just very sweet of you. Well, we were following you closely. You were on the ground and you were getting first-hand reports, and that was, it was great reporting. Thank you. Thank you. Let's move on to your fantastic sure. reporting. Um, I have this great op-ed from you, mm -hmm. and I want to start with uh, Bernanke because he's been on the Hill a couple times, and uh, people really focused on the dual mandate because some are really uh, interested in inflation and some are really interested in employment, and there's really this idea that one has to do with the other. Is there a relationship, though, between the two, as maybe economic models would imply? Well, uh, historically, there's been actually very little relationship between inflation and unemployment. We've seen examples in the late 70s, early 80s, where we had high inflation and high unemployment. We had to invent a new word for it called stagflation, the old Phillips curve trade-off where inflation could be lower, but unemployment could be higher. That was the theory. It never worked out in practice. The fact is you can get bad results from in both 
gauges. That was the misery index that Ronald Reagan talked about, and I think uh, uh, we'll see something like that again. Uh, you know, when the chairman says uh, he doesn't seek higher inflation with regard to the unemployment mandate, he does seek higher inflation with regard to uh, cheapening the value of the dollar. This is what the currency wars are all about. There's very little doubt. They're talking 2 percent inflation. What they want is 4 percent inflation. They want to shock people into thinking that inflation is coming like a runaway freight train. So we'll do what? We'll go out and borrow, spend, get that refrigerator, get that TV set, buy risky assets, et cetera, to try to get the economy moving. The problem is it's just creating another bubble. Another bubble. And just to confirm, so the Phillips curve is just not even it's relevant. Very you little. can have high unemployment and high inflation, as the 70s showed. Correct. Very little empirical yeah. support for that. Okay. Let's stick to inflation, because I want to bring up this chart that we saw on Zero Hedge. It shows the growth in the size of the BOJ, the ECB, and the Fed's balance sheets over the past year and a half, increased by 32 percent. I'm curious how much you think this is driven by these banks trying to prop up asset prices, as we've seen in the U.S. and Europe, certainly. And how much is competitive de devaluation of the kind that you write about in your book? Yeah. Well, I think the answer is it's both. I mean, you've got to prop up asset valuations to protect the banks. You know, if housing and commercial real estate and stocks and others found their sort of true non-manipulated level, the level they would reach without money printing by the central banks, they'd all be in trouble. So that's part of it. But then they're also trying to kind of inflate their way out of the debt, make the debt cheaper. You know, they've said before, we'll say to China, here's the trillion dollars we owe you, but it's not worth, uh, you know, you can't buy a car with it. Right. So because we're going we're gonna to print our way out of it. And historically, that's what the United States has done. So um, again, I just, uh, the, uh, and by the way, 2% inflation, the chairman at his last press conference uh, answering reporters' questions, he made it sound benign, like, oh, we can live with 2%. 2% yeah. will cut the value of a dollar by 75% in a normal lifetime. It's, wow. you know, 35 years, it's in half, and then 35 more years, it's in half again. 4% inflation will cut the value of the dollar in half. But by the time your, your young children go to college, the value of the dollar is cut in half. So 2% and 4% are cancerous. These are not benign rates of inflation. I'd like to see zero, which means price stability. And, you know, when we speak about that, too, I want to talk a little about 0% interest rates because you have to, to talk about currency wars. You have a really poignant part in your book where you're talking about how couples actually committed suicide right. by putting their heads in ovens to have carbon gas. monoxide poisoning right. in Weimar, Germany, when there was hyperinflation. I'm not at all comparing the United States to that situation. But there is a situation of 0% interest rates, of savers not being able to save, and it being dismissed as, oh, okay, you know, the economy's bad, so savers shouldn't be able to say, but isn't this the backbone of of the economy? That's exactly right, Lauren. Economists, uh, you know, and Paul Krugman and others, Member Naki, talk about consumption and government spending, and they have this notion, this Keynesian notion of aggregate demand, and they say, gee, we're not buying enough stuff, the consumer is not there, so we need government spending to make up the shortfall in consumer spending. But there's another component of GDP, it's called investment. Mm -hmm. Why do they always forget the investment account? Let's have Why savings. <laughs> well, because I think they, they like a consumer-driven economy, they like inflation, uh, they like to bail out the banks. Why not have an investment-driven economy? Mm -hmm. Encourage savings. Uh, instead of forcing savers to go out and buy riskier assets, why not reward savers? Why don't we raise interest rates and make the U.S. a magnet for savings from around the world? Mm -hmm. And by the way, in Weimar, Germany, you know, economists like to say, well, we cheapen the value of the dollar, but so what? Your wages went up, so it all comes out in the wash. That may be true on average, but it's not true individual by individual. There are winners and losers. Well, we know who the winners are. There are hedge funds, there are bankers, people who buy gold, people who buy hard assets. The losers are, you know, teachers, firemen, people relying on a pension, insurance policies, annuities. Anyone on a fixed income, their savings are eroded by the Fed's policy. So it's really a wealth transfer from everyday Americans to the elites. Yeah, a really good point. It's a wealth transfer, which right. is what, you know, people don't often frame it in that way, and it's so important to do. I want to ask you about one currency wars related story that's just recently come out because we were talking about uh, the G3 mm -hmm. um, central banks. New data shows that Japan has used what they're calling stealth intervention uh, in November to stem yen gains because uh, earnings were getting hammered with right. some of their exports from cars to electronics. Is this a kind of covert special ops currency wars with stealth uh, sure. intervention? Sure. We've seen it in China with stealth purchases of gold and now in Japan with stealth intervention. They're all just variations of the currency wars. And remember, the thing about a currency war is a zero-sum game. Not everybody can cheap in at once. If somebody's going to get cheaper, somebody else is going to have, be more expensive. So you have winners and losers. Lately, you know, the, they, we've been trying to, the Fed and the Treasury have been trying to cheapen the dollar, which, by the way, implies a stronger euro and a stronger yen. But Japan's an export-driven economy. They need a cheap yen to promote their exports. So it looks like uh, the, well, I focus a lot on the U.S. 
China currency war, but there's a U.S.-Japan currency war going on also. Well, you see the U.S. come out and criticize Japan's move, but isn't the U.S. doing the same thing? The U.S. is the biggest currency manipulator in the world. Look, all major countries manipulate their currencies. I mean, let's be candid. The Chinese yeah. do it, the Japanese do it, the Europeans do it. The U.S. is just better at it than anybody else because we have a bigger printing press. Yeah. We, we sort of say, hey, you want to print money? We'll show you how to print money. We'll print more. And by the way, this is the key to QE3. If you see a weak dollar, there might not be easing, but if you see a stronger dollar or a dollar holding its own, that's the green light for QE3. And I think the Fed chairman has signaled that in a series of recent speeches and interviews. You can see the easing coming probably in May or June. In May or June is your prediction. Correct. You'll probably be right because you're not with the mainstream econo economist pack that is often wrong. Well, maybe I'll come back in June and we'll see, yeah, we'll see yeah. how we're doing. But that's how, that's how it looks from here. I'm going to hold you to it. Okay. Um, just to back up quickly, when you said you think the Fed is creating a bubble, where do you think we're going to see that? Because well, I should... Sure. Well, of course, the main place you see it is in gold. That's the ultimate uh, cross rate. And, and, you know, gold did have that mini boom in August and then backed off a little bit. But now it's back up into the mid-1750s. I think that will continue to get stronger. Uh, we're seeing in oil prices, although that's really a geopolitical factor because of what's going on in the Persian Gulf. Uh, but remember, if you can see an asset bubble, if asset prices just hold their own, if they're supposed to go down, mm -hmm. if we need lower prices to clear markets and create new investment, but they're up here, even if they're not skyrocketing, that's a form of inflation based on the difference between where they are and where they should be normally if, the, if it was not being manipulated. And so that's a different kind of asset bubble. But the Fed, we're seeing it in the stock market. I've actually okay. said this will be a good year for stocks. Mm -hmm. Uh, not, not based on fundamentals, but based on money printing. Wall Street loves free money. Yeah, they sure love the easy money. Speaking of geopolitical issues, let's talk about Iran. Mm -hmm. uh, with Rick Santorum winning several of the primaries last night, I was going back through uh, his sound bites at the saber rattling at Iran, and he's certainly not alone. I mean, there are reports that there could be an Israeli attack mm -hmm. this spring um, from multiple sources. First, let's talk about the currency war aspect, though, because you were telling me that there's a whole financial warfare sure. aspect of this, and there was that report that, like, looking back, Iran has been diversifying out of the dollar and into gold, um, and then we've seen economic sanctions, which have frozen the central bank and them from trading in gold. So there seems to be this whole currency war aspect there, too. So maybe you could speak to those. There is. I mean, Iran has been trying to get out of dollar. Look, they get they earn dollars in world markets by selling oil. Now, the sanctions are tightening up lately, but they have a, they have a lot of dollars to their account. They've been trying to buy gold. They buy a lot of what's called scrap, and scrap is just either jewelry and cast up, but it's gold, and a lot of it's smuggled in through Dubai. It can be melted down and turned into ingots. That's one source of gold for them. But what's going on right now, there's sort of two kinds of currency wars. There's the currency wars we've been speaking about, U.S. and China, we're cheaping your currencies to promote exports, except all you get is inflation. But there's currency war as actual warfare, and that's what's going on with Iran. What the United States did, the president imposed sanctions on the Central Bank of Iran, right. Bank Marchese, cut them out of the dollar system. Suddenly, if you're a merchant in Iran and you need dollars to buy imports, they had to double their local currency prices. Things went from 200,000 reals to 400,000 reals because they needed more reals to buy dollars on the black market so they could get the dollars to import goods. So their currency dropped 40 percent against the dollar in one day. Then they, we imported hyperinflation and we injected hyperinflation into Iran because they had to raise the local currency prices. The Iranian banks raised their interest rates to 20 percent to stop a run on the bank because people were pulling the reals out to dump them into hard assets. So we gave them a trashed currency, hyperinflation, and 20 percent interest rates. Four weeks before the elections, and this is not a coincidence in my view, because what we're trying to do is generate regime change. So this is sort of trying to reboot the Green Revolution Part 2. Wow. put their economy into total turmoil so that when the elections come and they will be rigged and the people will be disappointed again, maybe we'll get the Green Revolution again. All designed to get regime change to stop the nuclear program. So it's wow. a massive play. I, I want to keep con continuing on this conversation because, of course, there is the uh, the uh, alternative of what if there actually is some kind of warfare or conflict. Mm -hmm. I want to get your take on that. We have to go to break quickly, but we will be right back with, uh, with Currency Wars author Jim Rickards. And still ahead, do not go away with money as ammunition. What will be the only fighter left standing in the currency wars? We'll talk gold with Jim Rickards. But first, your closing market numbers. We just put a picture of me when I was like nine years old on to tell the truth. I 
have a confession. I am a total ghetto princess. I love rap and hip-hop music and Christian music. I thought he was kind of a dick yesterday. I'm very proud of the role that Al Jazeera has played. You know how sometimes you see a story and it seems so whole and complete, you think you understand it, and then you glimpse something else. You hear or see some other part of it and realize everything you thought you knew, you don't know? I'm Tom Hartman. Welcome to The Big Picture. drives the world. The fear mongering used by politicians. Who makes decisions? Considerable breakthrough has already been made. Who can you trust? No one who is imbued with a global missionary zeal. Where are we heading? State controlled capitalism is called fascism. When nobody dares to ask, we do. RT question more. Welcome back. We are here with Jim Rickard, Senior Managing Director of Tangent Capital Partners, author of Currency Wars. Before the break, we were talking about financial warfare that is already being committed against Iran in Jim Rickard's view. Now let's talk about what would happen if there were actual warfare. Because first I want to know, obviously you have GOP saber rattling in some of these reports that there will be an attack. Do you think there will be some kind of actual armed conflict or airstrikes with Iran? And does it matter who's president, or is this going to happen regardless? I think it's likely to happen regardless. The, the thing is, uh, Lauren, the main thing is to make sure that Iran does not get a nuclear weapon. So that's the starting place for all the analysis. So how do you stop them? Well, the first way we try was diplomacy, which has failed. I mean, the Bush administration, Obama administration tried very hard at diplomacy, but it didn't work because the Iranians were not bargaining in good faith. The second thing which we're seeing play out is uh, psychological operations, cyber warfare, sabotage, assassination. That's been going on for years. Been fairly effective at disrupting things, but hasn't really stopped the Iranians in their tracks. The third way is regime change. We talked a little bit about that before the break. And this whole the U.S. is going for it. Going for it, and absolutely. And look, no one worries that India has nuclear weapons because it's a democracy and it's moderate. So it's, it's, it's as much about the regime as it is about the weapons if you get regime change. But that probably won't happen. They're completely ruthless. So the fourth way is war. So nobody wants it. Nobody wants to see it happen. But it does seem likely uh, because the Iranians are not backing away from this nuclear program. Then the question is timing. If you wait till 2013, it's too late. The Iranians will test the device in all likelihood before then. You're not going to see it on the eve of the presidential elections. It looks a little hokey. You're not going to see it before March because we want to see how the elections play out. There's a lot of intelligence content in the election results. So that leaves a window of kind of May to August. And I don't know what the secret war plans are, but that's when I would look for it sometime in the June, July time Great. frame. We're going to have war with Iran and quantitative easing. Uh, well, they may, they, may <laughs> not be, they may not be unrelated. Look, no, if oil, no, if oil goes to 300, you're going to need some quantitative well, easing. And that's my question, okay? We've had a lot of predictions of what happens if there is any kind of conflict with Iran. $250 a barrel oil is what I've heard from one analyst. Rubini says we'd have a global recession. What would be the impact of any on any global recovery or on a global recession if there was any kind of conflict with Iran? Well, I think it's a very famous uh, general in a German uh, general in World War One, he said, "No battle plan survives the first shot." You may think you know what's going to happen, and yeah, you do the best you can to model it. But the truth is, you're just playing wild cards at that point. So, of course, we would expect the price of oil to go up significantly. But a lot of people take a naive view of what would happen in the Straits of Hormuz. Say the Iranians uh, close it, and they'll say, "Well, the U.S. will clean it up in a day." It might not be a day; it might be a month. I mean, that, that's the kind of thing. Or we could lose a vessel. Sadly, I mean, a lot of things could play out in unexpected ways. Um, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of Hezbollah in Lebanon. Well, guess what? There's a lot of Hezbollah in South America. They could find their way to the United States. You might see uh, General Clapper was warning the other day about domestic Iranian-backed terrorism in the United States. So there could be shocks and disruption that are not on anybody's radar screen. I don't think all this is fully priced in the market. Look, people understand it. We're talking about it and others are talking about it. But markets are sometimes slow to react. So this is not fully priced. 
Interesting. And, and what about what we were talking about with financial warfare? Do you actually think that, think that there could be a blowback in the form of countries just moving away from the U.S. dollar? Right. It's starting already, uh, but partly because of Bernanke's policies. Uh, you know, when, when you can't have a strong national security without a strong dollar. We've been printing so many dollars and trying to cheapen our currency. The countries have already started to think about getting out of the dollar system. Now we're giving them another reason, which is we're using it as a weapon. I'm not saying we shouldn't do that because we need to confront the Iranian regime. But the Iranians, there's some reports that they've, they're talking to the Indians about doing a gold for oil swap. There's a lot of gold in India, uh, so that actually is feasible. It's interesting that the Saudi Arabians have stepped up to supply the oil shortfall to China. So if China can't have Iranian oil, they'll get it from the Saudi Arabians. But what about the Indians? They need oil, too. They're kind of like out in the cold. So they're talking to uh, the Indians, rather. So the Indians are talking to the Iranians. China may get in the act. I could see a Russian, Chinese, Indian, Iranian, Central Asian clearinghouse that would be non-dollar denominated, could be commodity back, could be local currency back, set up a message system. They could just be completely outside the dollar system. Very interesting. And we just have 30 seconds, but does all of this uh, mean that gold comes out the winner, it sounds like? There's no, there's no question about it. Or, you know, I like to say gold is constant, everything else is the loser. But yes, short answer is the dollar price of gold will go up significantly. Gold will perform well relative to all currencies because, you know, as you showed in your graphic, all the major central banks are printing like crazy. So, you know, there may be leads and lags and noise in the crossroad, but gold is going to go way up. Well, I have to thank you so much for being on the show. Thank it's you. always so nice to have you. Your insight is just amazing. And, uh, and if anybody hasn't, they should read the book. That's uh, author and senior managing director of Tangent Capital Partners, Jim Rickards.